Welcome, everyone. Um, this is, it's good to see everybody. Welcome to our last very big week of public events in the series, The Past is Present, New Montagnard Artists. My name is Andrew Young, today's host. Our presentation today is a special addition to the Past is Present, New Montagnard Artists series. Our presenter is Betsy Renfrew. She is a studio artist and educator in her own right, but in her talk today, an appreciation of Montagnard backstrap weaving, artistry, history, technique, she'll be taking her own artist eye and knowledge and applying it to the, these beautiful pieces which represent an important part of Montagnard tradition. Uh, before I begin, um, before we begin, a few uh, essential acknowledgements. I'll go through these very fast. This project is made possible by funding provided by Creative Greensboro, the Office of Arts and Culture of the City of Greensboro through a Catalyzing Creativity Grant. A shout out too to Montagnard Dega Association and its branch, a uh, youth branch, the Montagnard American Organization for applying for the grant. Please check out the chat section for links to the past is present, Facebook page, and this busy week of interviews, presentations, and celebrations. And I'll refresh that chat page and just that chat site in just a sec for those who can't see it. This evening's program structure will consist of the featured artist presentation at about 6.15 or so. We'll break for questions. If you'd like to use the chat feature to ask questions or to make comments, please do. We will also invite your live questions on camera at that time as well. Uh, Jelly Wong is doing tonight's camera work. And now it's with great pleasure that I turn things over to this evening's presenter, Betsy Renfrew. Hello everyone, I'm Betsy Renfrew and I'm going to give you an overview of Montagnard weaving. I'm going to start with a short overview of the history of backstrap weaving in Southeast Asia. And then I'm going to bring 10 pieces one by one and discuss some of the more interesting attributes, whether technical or interesting motifs for each of them. The last 15 minutes of our program, I'd like to open it up to questions, conversations about today's presentation and the pieces. Okay, all right. Let's talk about the origins now. All right, backstrap weaving in Southeast Asia probably began with proto Thai speaking people around 3,000 years ago in what is today Southern China. These people migrated throughout Southeast Asia bringing a backstrap weaving technology with them. These traditions are still practiced in Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam, including the Central Highlands, which is where the Montagnard are from, and the Cham, a closely related people uh, of Southern Vietnam. The indigenous people of Vietnam's Central Highlands include two major linguistic groups, the Mon Khmer and the Malayo Polynesian. The ancestors of the Mon Khmer speaking peoples migrated south from the Yangtze River in what's today modern China into Thailand, Laos, and Burma, as well as the Mekong River areas. In Vietnam, some of their descendants are the Nong, Steng, Sedang, Ho, Han, and they are some of the earliest people to settle in the Central Highlands. Malayo Polynesian speakers come from Borneo and migrated to Sumatra and Vietnam by around 600 before the common era, later than the Mon Khmer people's arrival in Vietnam. Their descendants are the Cham, Jedi, and Rade. During this time, the Dong Song culture flourished in Vietnam and other places in Southeast Asia, several centuries before the common era and several centuries after the common era. The Dong Song people produced many trade goods that have been found throughout Southeast Asia, including bronze drums. The decorative motif seen on some of these bronzes strongly relate to the designs found in Montagnard weaving. The Malayo Polynesians may not have known weaving when they arrived in Vietnam, but soon they had contact with the Thai speaking people associated with the people of the Dong Song culture. The design motifs of spirals, roms, twined linear elements may also be derived from such things as plated bamboo and rattan fibers for baskets and mats. 
Even though the Mon Khmer and the Malayo Polynesian people came to Vietnam's central highlands in separate waves of migration, many of their cultural traits have influenced each other. The Highland tribes have shared, borrowed, and altered patterns and techniques of backstrap weaving amongst one another for generations, yet each tribe has distinctive variations and tastes for specific features. All right, so I'm going to start showing you these pieces. Get, begin with this first piece as a way of, of kind of orienting us to the type of weaving, backstrap weaving is, you'll notice that this is a giant circle. And which is one of the features of a continuous warp. It's not been cut yet. Um, this is exactly how it looks when it comes off the loom and all of the loom parts have been taken away. This is a piece that was woven by Junyi, and she is uh, Rade or Ide. And what's characteristic of a lot of Ide fabrics are a black background and a very, very large or more prominent design that runs through the middle. And these are some of the things that we'll see throughout these, these textiles is that some of these particular patterns are called supplemental, warp patterning and they tend to have a kind of quality where they look like they're floating above the surface okay it's a, a fairly difficult technique to do on other types of looms and so forth this is something that Juni is is known for quite well there are other types of designs in here as well with our, which are an alternating warp uh, an alternating float warp pattern so they're slightly different but they're what's called supplementary, uh, supplemental, and they are part of the wet, uh, the excuse me, the warp design and the warp. Just to kind of remind us of what a warp and a weft is, a warp runs along here um, in this direction, and the weft is going to be going in the opposite direction to be the width. All right, this next piece here was also woven by Judy. I mean, this piece has been finished. It has fringes that have been uh, tied off so they won't unravel. But the characteristics here that I'd like to point out are designs that are called supplementary weft. So in this particular piece, the weft is running this way. The warp is running this way. This is the design that I want to focus on. This is called a, a discontinuous supplementary warp, uh, excuse me, weft, supplementary weft. And I can actually see where the fabric, where the fiber begins and coils through uh, and ends up uh, in just that particular motif. There are other supplementary weft pieces in here as well. They run continuous across the surface, so there are two different types. What's quite interesting about these weft techniques here are that you don't see them on the other side. They seem to ride on the front, they don't go through to the back there. So this is a supplementary weft addition here. Um, I find this a little unusual, these dotted lines, we don't see this too much in dry weaving, but in this piece, she's brought that out. These particular designs that we see here running on the white part are the designs that in some instances come from the Dong Song culture, others very, very ancient designs, some of them geometric, and some of them picking up motifs and ideas from nature. It's a piece that's also woven by Judy. And this is a skirt. So 
I want to focus on with this particular skirt here is, in addition to some of the designs that we've already just seen, I want to focus on the joining of the panels. And these skirts are usually two panels that are joined together. So in the middle of the skirt, and even for blankets, it's a kind of join that you see right here. It's extremely strong. And what she's done is she's brought it out to be a decorative element. Okay. The cross loop knit type uh, of join. And here it's done very exquisitely. And uh, she's got many different colors that bring these together. It's very, very tough. It's hard to break it apart. Not like the seams that we have in our modern clothing. <laughs> The second feature I want to point out in this particular skirt here is something called kate. And in fact, I'm gonna flip this around. And get a better look at it. All right, this is the kate design. And this is something that is off the loom technique. It is a, uh, a weft uh, twining technique and the texture of it and the sort of look of the each individual thread is a bit different than the woven part. It is connected. It's not been added or sewn on top. This is actually woven into this, or it's actually an off loom technique, but it is part of it, it's continuous with it. You also notice that um, there's a backside there. It looks a bit different, but this truly shows me that this has been twined, okay? And twining has to do with taking two um, threads and wrapping them around the warp. So Junie and her skirt patterns. The next piece I'm going to show is, is another skirt, but it is a skirt that is now from, I'm going to look at something that is dry. And I'm just gonna put this in half here because it sits on our, our little table here a little bit better. Dry uh, textiles, especially women's clothing, like the eBay, will also have a, a lot of black or dark blue background. And for, for the Jedi, there's often a red panel with lots of decorative motifs inside here. This is another example of the supplementary warp um, technique here, the patterning. And these are extremely fine threads. This is woven by Nike Ballon, and she loves these very, very tiny, thin threads. And so she's also added a little bit of the gold foil in there. You might be able to see a little bit of a glitter. And one of the really unique things about Nike Ballon as a, as a weaver is, she is an expert with the kate. She does her own. Sometimes women in a family will split up the different sorts of parts of warping and weaving and finishing them up. She does her own. And these are exquisite. Uh, once somebody asked her, what if we make a mistake? She says, make no mistakes. <laughs> so she's very, very good at the kate. Also notice the, the fringes you see on the bottom, many multi-year clothes have these fringes, they're either braided or twisted at the end, sometimes with some starch, just to keep it from unraveling. Her joinery is a little bit more simple, um, but she's got a kind of zigzag stitch on here. They are quite strong though, these will not fall apart. I'm going to switch to a banana skirt here. Try to lay the whole thing out. This is done with, with acrylic, so it has a slightly different feel to it. Many of the traditional ones would have been done in cotton. But one of the things about acrylic yarn is you get very, very bright color. And some of the techniques that are being used here, you need a thicker thread. So you probably notice right away that there's not as much black on them. Many of the banal skirts have a lot of busy patterning, and it almost looks like it's kind of a patchwork quilt. It's not. These are all 
part of the same fabric right here. Um, I believe that the central panel here is the alternating um, warp float. I'm not entirely sure on that because it's so wide. I'll show the back side here just so that any of you that might be able to work this out, but it's very, very tight. It doesn't quite float like some of the others which you need, um, but this is something that I find really exquisitely done. And the pattern here is something that comes from or is related to the Dong Song culture with these patterns being on these bronze implements that I talked about before. Very, very old. Um, I find them very difficult um, motifs to really bring up into things. And you'll notice down here, this is a totally different kind of scheme here. It's all part of this panel. You'll see figuration in Bonong textiles and the people sometimes will be in these. And these appear to be embroidered, but they're not. They're supplementary, and you don't see them on the back side here. So they are supplementary, and they're just kind of pieced in here a little bit at a time. And you can see where they're hiding when they're not coming to the surface, they're just below that. And so that's a very beautiful technique that is combined with this very um, this green and this red. Uh, let's see. Yeah. And then the join here. Okay. The join on this particular fabric is not as obvious. Okay. So it's very, very um, not visible. Okay. And maybe a few more elements here of the weft, supplementary weft right here. This next piece is a bit of a mystery. It's a baby carrier. It's extremely long. It probably was used. Some of the fabrics that you have seen so far look rather new, brand new, not washed. This has been used, uh, but we're not really sure exactly which tribal group wove this. We think it's probably from Paipu. Some of the folks that I've talked to, either Paipu, Banhar, uh, Rade, possibly Jirai, it's got a kind of dry sense of um, large black background and then the red here, but the yellow stripes running through this supplementary warp pattern, uh, I don't have replicated in any of my other fabrics. I have seen it in Banhar fabrics. Back side. And these float techniques are such that you can usually, the threads will cross over many, many lines, many, many um, wefts. This is a lozenge, well, excuse me, it's a, a rum and um, a rom, I, I would call it a diamond, but sometimes it's called a rom um, design. I consider this piece to probably be one of the hardest ones to warp. I can't imagine warping this. So. <laughs> I'm going to show the next two pieces together because I 
believe that they probably were woven by the same weaver, certainly the same group. And I believe this to be Kaho. And let's see, I'm just order it up there. They are skirts. They are well worn. And one of the features that I'd really like to focus on in this piece is the inclusion of an ecat stripe. This is running along the, this is the warp. So the warp would be the longer, along the longer element here. And when you look at ecat, it goes from light to dark. And when you stand back, it has a kind of speckled effect. This is something that was probably learned by the Cham or learned from the Cham. We learned it from the Thai speaking groups of people. Not that many Montagnard groups use ECOT. It's very, very simple. Um, they've included in again the, the warp, um, but it's, it's a little bit on the rare side. You don't see it too much. We see it in the skirt right here. We also see it in the skirt right next to it. This is the ecot. An ecot, by the way, is like tie dye. It's basically where you tie a resist around a, a fiber, you dip it in dye, take it out, take the resist off, and so you have areas that didn't accept the dye. And this is something that's a highly sophisticated technique that also is being used in Indonesia, Indonesian textile. Okay, the next piece I have is a rather large blanket. This blanket could use a bit of cleaning and it's okay that we can see the weaver's name and actually gives you credit. I should mention that there was a very kind soul named Sister Gretchen. And Sister Gretchen was a Catholic nun who early on assisted Montagnard refugees when they first came to Greensboro, driving them to doctor's appointments and things like that. She has since passed away. But over the years, many of the people who she helped gave her or paid her back with many of these blankets. She gave them to me in the hopes that I would educate people or show people all of these beautiful weaving traditions. This one is woven by Anna Bui, who I believe is Pierre Cabru's wife. I believe that uh, Pierre Cabru is Srey. I don't know what tribe his wife is from, but this has a kind of Caho look to it because many Caho fabrics are white, this is undyed, it's a very natural cotton right here. And in addition to the striping that we see here, brown and the kind of black, the alternating float pattern right here, we also have in the central panel where there's the blue and the red, fairly thick yarn, this is the supplementary weft. Okay, so the weft here, I'm going the right way, yeah. Weft here would be going back and forth like this. Notice the join. This one's a little bit different than what we saw from the Rade. And down at the bottom, 
And I should have mentioned the, the why these finishing techniques are used at, at the very end of the warp. You can tell this is the direction of the warp with the fringes here. This does look like a kate. I'm not sure if it's the same thing as kate, but it is. it looks like it's been wrapped or twined. It is continuous with the weaving. It's not been something that's been simply sewn on there. It is part of this, whether it was taken off the loom or, or not. I'm not absolutely certain on that. But this is a way of keeping the whole fabric from unraveling. Otherwise, you would have you know, a lot of threads coming out. And then these are either twisted uh, or braided or something like that. So you'll often see kind of a, uh, a little bit coming off here like this. And that just indicates that it's a different technique than what was used in the main warp right here. Okay. We have time for one more. Got one here. It's quite large. Right, this last piece here, I do know it is Kahol. It's given to me by a Kahol woman. And it is one panel. Two panels would make a skirt. And you'll notice here that we've got the blue background, which we might see quite often in uh, multi-nured weaving. This, of course, is not, this is not dyed with indigo on cotton, which would have been traditional. This is probably modern acrylic thread here. I can feel it. But it's very beautifully crafted. I see no errors in this at all. Uh, it's repeating the same pattern throughout. So it doesn't quite have the same sort of busyness that you might see in a Renon. It doesn't have the little figures that you see in Rodé. Uh, slightly different finishing down at the bottom here. There might be some um, embroidery stitched in here. I'm not quite sure exactly how this is finished, a little bit different. But again, these sort of finishing um, techniques used here are to keep the fabric from unraveling. It's very simply done, but very, very good edges too. <laughs> Those of you that are weavers appreciate good edges. I've always had a hard time getting good edges on, on fabrics when I'm weaving. Uh, but again, this is Caho, and um, probably would be one panel or a skirt. Or it could be used for making men's clothing, um, vests and things like that. Okay. So we're at six o'clock right now. And uh, so we're actually en ended up a little bit early in terms of your presentation. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run to my computer and go ahead and put the question to you, okay? We have one question. And uh, let's, let's see, the question is from uh, Zoe Van Bura. And she's asking for pieces that are woven here in the United States. Has moving to the U.S. affected the choices that weavers make in style, design, and motif? Similarly, have there been any changes in the traditions or style preferences of wearing these woven garments? Okay, um, I might start off with the techniques and the motifs. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that um, well, that last one of the earlier pieces I showed you this probably was woven in Vietnam. I, I can't be absolutely certain, but it doesn't have the commercial kind of quality to it. So the, there's a feel and a look that's a little bit different. I think the women adjust to it. They choose things that they like. They are choosing the more brightly colored things that probably wouldn't have existed a um, hundred years ago, 75 years ago, but it's the weaver's choices. Um, bright colors, probably pretty exciting for people. Um, so the choices of working with acrylic and synthetics, there's a lot of synthetics in here. It doesn't take away from the beauty of the designs. Um, as far as being able to weave the 
complicated designs that some of them may know. It's possible. I do know that some of the women prefer a certain kind of thickness of crochet thread. If it's not available, then they'll go to something that's synthetic and may not get quite the same result. Synthetics are more slippery. They, they don't have that kind of cotton. It's really beautiful because it kind of stays it has a kind of quality to it that, that doesn't slide or slip, unlike nylon. So that's, and, and the second question, what was the second question? So the second part that we have part. is, uh, if the question was, well, just to refresh your memory here, uh, we talked about the, the, the choices that weavers make in style and design and motif, and then the second part being, similarly, have there been any changes in the traditions or style preferences of wearing these woven garments? Yes, there have. And I've actually brought in pieces that are essentially panels. The pieces I did not bring, I should have, there was a beautiful vest, a man's vest that was in the collection. I didn't bring it. And it's been tailored. So once women learn how to use sewing machines and understand darts and things like that, those have been incorporated. These are not. These are pretty much rectangles. So some of the older or more traditional um, um, amongst them will use the older style. I think one of these had a dart in it. I'm not sure two people, but the darts would be ways of, of sort of accommodating the skirt to make it look a little more feminine, um, to make women look like they have a waist instead of it just being kind of a, a, a large kind of fabric. So that might be it. Now, the younger women definitely Love the, the, love the material, but they will make some of the most fantastic tailored outfits that fit their figures and are not kind of a generic one size fits all. That's what I found. So here's a, a comment from uh, Melina Kassar. She's okay. saying, as a uh, multi tribal indigenous Mastanyard, that is Benong Jarai and Benar, I grew up seeing all of these types of textiles. Super proud of Mastanyard women who take love and time into their art. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Melina. I really appreciate you saying that. Um, and please, you know, if you know any women that still are doing these things in Vietnam, I mean, really check in on them and find how they're doing and there's a market for it. Um, one of the difficulties in America is that Montagnard women traditionally have done have made these for specific purposes. You give a baby carrier to somebody who's just had a baby and are less keen on going out there and hawking their sales. So, um, you know, that, that's what makes it harder for this tradition to live in this country is, is finding a market and, and having a demand for it. But yeah, thank you. Marie. So I'm waiting to see if there are other questions here and um, we'll stall for time. And while I'm asking you a question, Let's see, uh, maybe some more questions will come in. Oh, sure. okay, I see a question coming in, but I'm gonna stick mine in first. <laughs> um, way back, uh, you went to Washington DC to the Textile Museum, and you have brought some of these pieces to an expert, and maybe you could tell that story about what Madabel Gettinger's uh, response was. Yeah, Madabel Gettinger um, goes way back, and her husband, I think, knew Gerald Hickey, and Gerald Hickey was the, renowned chronicler of Montagnard people. Um, I took this particular piece here. She wasn't really sure. She said she's really interested in it. She, she'd like to hear me later on find out if I, I could find out anything about it. But she couldn't quite pinpoint it. She did steer me in the right direction. At first, I thought it was something totally different. <laughs> I will not even tell you what I thought it was. But she did kind of steer me in the right direction. And she did say when I said, well, I'm, I'm learning backstrap weaving. She said, oh, you are brave. <laughs> so <laughs> um, she is an expert on Thai textiles. And so she's written several books on that. She's less knowledgeable on specifics. Um, Michael Howard, I think, is the expert there. But she did give me her time. And it was a really good insight. She basically said, embed yourself in the community, learn all you can, learn the words for the techniques and how each of the different tribes does something different. With Thai textiles, she says, there's always a tradition for giving things. When is that occasion? I don't really get a sense that it's, it's there are ceremonial um, aspects, I could be wrong, other than when there's a birth of a baby, 
give the mother a baby carrier and someone dies. They like to have a blanket over the coffin. Um, there may be other times that I'm un unaware of. Um, so I was not really that knowledgeable about ceremonial occasions when they're given as gifts. That might be more of a Buddhist thing. Um, but she was she was fairly helpful, but not real keen on saying, well, you know, or she, she did say, well, you know, people study the more exquisite uh, textiles, the Thai, Indonesian. And I, I really had to, to, um, to defend Montagnier weaving in that this is not something someone could replicate that easily. And I did ask, did you need, or that be a Necrolon later, I said, can you weave this? She said, no, it's too hard. So she, she's an expert weaver. So I think one of the things is, is that as women die, uh, that have knowledge of certain techniques, that particular style is gone, that motif is gone, it's probably not going to come back. Some people can probably reverse engineer this, but she did give me encouragement to go on and find out, learn the words, understand the, the tradition of weaving. And I have learned how to weave. I'm nowhere near as good as what you see right here. In fact, I cannot warp a design. <laughs> I can only warp some stripes under the tutelage of some good um, running women. We've got, uh, now we have a bunch of questions coming in. Okay, great. Um, uh, Zoe Van Buren asks a follow-up question, I think. Well, uh, do you know how many active weavers are in North Carolina or even the U.S.? I don't know how many there are. I've, I've tried to meet as, as many as I can. And Greensboro, of course, is the area with the largest concentration of Montenegro women. There probably are some in Raleigh. What I've found, though, is that if I don't know the women personally through teaching them English, they're extremely shy. I do know one woman that sadly passed away recently. Um, there's a picture of her floating out there somewhere. Um, and another weaver, Juni, has unfortunately uh, retired from weaving because she has had a series of strokes. Nick Roulon is 80 and has difficulty getting around. She's probably still sharp as a, as a tack and, and you know, with her thinking and so forth. Uh, the COVID, epidemic has kind of slowed things down. But I would say that there are very few women that weave on a, on a regular basis that are over the age or under the age of 50. They're mostly elderly. If they've been here for many, many years, they may not have good eyesight anymore. They may not have good health. So they are, there are fewer and fewer of them. I don't know the exact number, but not that many. All right, we've got a question from uh, Jihong Chet. And she asks, do the patterns have symbolic meanings? I noticed there are a lot of lines and repeated shapes. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think is probably coming out, I'm going to show what they call the Manon. So Manon has a lot more things going on in, in, in the small space here. And as far as the meaning, it's not necessarily a particular meaning. Um, the figures aren't particular people. It's not an army. It's not a you know, no one particular. They're just sort of ways of decorating. I do know that the tradition of the supplementary warp technique is something that is a very old and very conservative technique, I guess because it's so difficult to, to do. And all of, many of those designs come from those Dong Song culture drums thousands of years ago. Uh, so some of those are just very ancient designs. Why diamonds predominate? One of the things I found is if you look at weaving, you'll find a lot of diamond patterns weaving of baskets, just simply the way that you have an under over under. Uh, you sometimes come up with squares, often come up with triangles, excuse me, um, uh, diamonds. And this particular one was called a, they actually called them a rhomboid figure. I just call it a diamond a rhomboid with the spirals coming off of it. That is something I see throughout Southeast Asia. I have seen so many variations of what they might mean. It could be a C, it's the way a, a bean is, is, looks when it's coming up out of the ground. These little spirals right here could be the bird unfolding. 
so there are vegetative qualities about it. When I've asked the women, what did this, what do these mean? What do you call it? They sometimes say, I don't know. I, I just weave it. But other women say that many of the designs come from things that people see around them. And we'll pull out Junie's because she does have some of these motifs that some of them are, are from the animal world and so forth. And it's not so much that this little lizard has any particular kind of meaning. I do see that motif a lot. I think they're just simply things that people see around them. Corn. Oh, I'm not sure if that's just something growing in a pot. And then here we have that wrong with the spiral again. I see that again and again. You also see it in the container. That is a very powerful symbol. I don't know what it means, though. I don't think it really has the kind of meaning it may have had. So, <laughs> I, wish I, I wish I knew that, you know, it definitely means X, Y, and Z, but many of them are just ancient traditions. Some of them are variations that we're going to come up with, um, and some of them are just things from nature. Okay, we, uh, we are having some sound problems, and I'm talking now just to see if Leanna's going to give me a thumbs up to say that my sound sounds good. Um, Leanna, we sound all right? You, you, it's okay. It's just fading out a little bit, but we can hear um, just... We can hear you enough, but it's fading out a little bit. But can I... Um, may I make my comments while I'm on? Were you able to hear me? Yes, if you could go ahead and repeat that. Okay, now I can hear you clearly. Um, yeah, yeah, earlier the sound was okay. It just fading out a little bit and it kind of got worse, but I do, um, I, I would like to make a comment that um, I really appreciate Betsy, um, you know, teaching English to all of the elder women in our community and taking the time to appreciate the artwork, the weaving artwork, and taking the time to learn uh, these work herself. Um, Betsy and I sat in a weaving class for a couple of months, and it is extremely difficult for a beginner uh, myself. I remember um, growing up, uh, sitting in the longhouse, you know, watching my mom does her we uh, did her weaving, um, and it took you know because she only did it when she had time, so it took her like weeks and months. So we treasure these items. So you don't really find the hand weaving or backstrap weaving a lot nowadays big since the machine comes along. So we treasure this item. So, you know, when you don't have money, when you get married, um, that you can use that for a dowry as an item to give to the guy's family. Um, so, um, and you know, my, we keep these at home. So we, um, we still treasure them. We don't let it go. And it's hard to buy them now. It's extremely expensive. The, um, the, you know, the backtrack weaving the authentic one. We just wanted to make that comments. Um, yeah. Thank you, Betsy, for taking the time to, um, teach us and taking the time to learn, um, from the women that you work with in the past, you know? Thank you for that appreciation. I've loved working with them. So hopefully I can learn from Hedin uh, in a future time. She was the last teacher I had, and she was very good with warping. Any other questions? So, Leanna, do you want to uh, take control here and see if we can get some more questions from the audience, or are there any other comments to be made? Um, no, there's, um, uh, there's no more question on Facebook live. Um, Dr. Chen said she hear you guys fine. Um, and thank you for answering her question. Do we have any other question from zoom people on zoom? And if you are one of our audience on Facebook live, feel free to um, type in your question for Betsy. And um, there was one um, particularly uh, 
uh, fabric that Betsy said she was not sure about um, where it came from, um, who did it. Maybe someone from the community know who did it or where th that was from. If they we did the weaving in Greensboro or in North Carolina or in Vietnam. If, yeah. Betsy, if you want to show that piece again, maybe someone can help us identify who did it. I'd love to know about this one. So we still have a little bit of time left. In fact, we're doing really well on time. So um, I, can, I'm, I can think of lots and lots of questions, uh, Muyana. And um, maybe um, I know, I'm, you can have a, you have a better uh, monitoring than I do about who's in and who's out of the room. But uh, one of the questions I wanna ask Betsy is, what's the experience of like of working with the ladies? What she was had, she had the opportunity to work with both uh, Nike Roland and Junia, as well as some of the others, but working side by side with them and learning from them. Oh, and I should mention that both of those two women won the 2015-2016 North Carolina Heritage Award. And that's really, really a great honor for uh, women who generally uh, hide in the shadows. They're just not known very well. Um, and one of the things is <laughs> these two women could not be more different. <laughs> um, even though there might be some similarity to some of the features of their weaving, they have very, very different people. Nike Milan would never let me be her student. <laughs> she, <laughs> she, um, whereas Ju is very, very, um, she was very patient. She was very good. Her philosophy was always, uh, you look, you know, and she would undo things or redo things for me. Um, she did all of the warping and then she, sh she showed me how to weave. I only wove things that were about this wide. I did not put designs in them because that was a little bit tricky. I do know that one time when uh, I was weaving a belt and I decided after I'd started weaving it, I wanna put one of these designs in here just like you have. Can you show me this? Well, Jews English wasn't that good, even though we communicated really well. And she got very flustered. And basically the end of it is, no, you can't. You can't add this in after you've taken the warp um, off of the warping poles and start weaving. And I thought you could. So that told me a little bit of story about uh, doing this um, and, and making sure that you've got that all thought out before you even get going with the warping. Nike, on the other hand, has been a fountain of information. I've talked to her endlessly about the dyes, the techniques, the materials, the plants, processes. Her English is quite good. In fact, she and I would talk because she wanted to learn English better. She wanted to practice it better. And I got to learn a little bit of Jedi from her and I'd write down all the words. Um, she didn't have a big enough space for me to, to, to learn in, and she was always hesitant to teach me, but she taught me in other ways. Um, she did uh, work with a, a friend of mine, Laverne Waddington. Um, Laverne came up several times, and Laverne did learn to work with a kete, and I've, I've, I think we videoed them, took pictures, and they worked really well together, and, and they respected one another. And I think that's it. <laughs> I'm probably not a good enough weaver to, to work with Nike, um, but uh, Laverne is an, is an expert. And so they, they actually did one of these designs uh, over an afternoon, a series of, of days. And so in that sense, um, two very different weavers, I've gotten to know them very well. The third weaver, um, Haden, is also uh, Rade, and I, I haven't really had a chance to work with her very, very long. One little story about her is she does come from the same village as Ju, Juni, and I opened up a, a loom that Ju had warped and we had rolled up, and I said, can we start weaving on this? And Haden said, no, I don't understand this warping. I don't know it. They come from the same village. So it's possible that every woman has their own way of warping, their own idiosyncrasies and so forth. Um, and I've often found that sometimes people are puzzled by what other people, I don't do it that way. 
So um, I always found that to be quite interesting. Can you say something about the actual threads and the, you know, where they're getting their threads from and the colors? Okay. Um, when they're weaving here in Greensboro, North Carolina, a favorite is um, mercerized cotton. And mercerized cotton is a kind of cotton that doesn't bleed. And oh, people love that because it's dye fast. It has a very smooth surface. I could just tell just by feeling it. Some of these older pieces that I brought out, um, I don't necessarily know if they're hand spun or not, but I can feel that they're, they're ordinary cotton. Nothing wrong with that. It just has a different feel to it. But a lot of the women have said that over the years in Vietnam, thread that's already is prepared is something that they've always had access to. However, their mothers, um, and so I'd have to put a date on there. I would say that before the war, probably people were still growing cotton and people were spinning. And the, the two weavers that Andrew mentioned, Unique, in Night Milan, they could spin. In fact, I've got tons of things that Ju has spun while she's teaching me, and I, I couldn't get you know past a foot. Uh, but she just would 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 spin coils and coils of, of cotton beautifully. So she could spin the cotton. She preferred to actually just get some that's already pre-spun. And I, you know, it's, it's an expense, but it's something that's more uniform. And I think that's something that the women probably preferred was uniform when it was available. The dyeing, I don't think any of these are hand dyed using natural materials. The brighter the color um, and even the color blue, I don't think that's available green. Um, some of the more traditional ones would be reds, blues and yellows. Uh, there might be some other types in there as well. I think that that big piece I had of the uh, Kaho that might have some natural colors in there, mostly because they have a kind of faded look to them and then added with the, the modern stuff in here. So the materials have changed. I think the women prefer modern materials. Either they don't have to do the work or they just kind of like the feel of it. Collectors on the other hand are always looking for natural materials, natural dyes, uh, hand spun things. That's probably going to be kind of rare in what I encounter. It doesn't mean it's not out there. Uh, I do know that many Montagnard people, as, as um, Leanna mentioned, um, they hold on to those blankets that their mothers, grandmothers made, and they're, and they're not going to get rid of them. Those, thing, those are actually probably very old, and they have some older techniques, older materials in them. Um, but they are modernizing. Also, the gold in here is not something, this is gold foil. <laughs> this is something that actually does fall apart after a while. Um, my thought is that it's, it's a way of sort of, um, I know that some Cambodian textiles um, have gold in them. Some of the, the more beautiful court uh, textiles from Cambodia have real gold in them. And this might be reminiscent of that. I just wanted um, to also add that we will only bring these out on special occasion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm like, like you cannot bottle them. It will only, we only use it for a special occasion. But um, anyway, so Zoe has a question in the chat. Zoe, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure, thank you, Betsy. Um, I just was curious if wool is ever used or if cotton is the primary material. I imagine the washability helps. I think cotton, is, since it's always been grown in the highlands, or not always, but it's been grown in the highlands and it's available in commerce, acrylic would be the next thing that's available in the tropics. People aren't going to want to wear wool in the tropics. I do know that uh, this Benong skirt is all acrylic. When these ladies wear this and they go dancing, you can see the sweat pouring off them. They're quite warm. <laughs> so um, wool, I don't believe is ever used. It's way too hot. It's not something that's available in Vietnam. Um, maybe in the northern reaches of, of Southeast Asia and China and so forth, they may have used wool, but I don't think they have ever used wool. It looks like wool, um, but this is acrylic. I would definitely have to agree on the the very the hot weather it does not mix we used to perform a lot a while back and um, wearing those things in the hot in August. 
during that or September National Folk Festival was yeah. not fun. <laughs> and then, um, so now, um, you know, a lot of um, the sewer, the people that are using the sewing machine, they're, they're putting stuff together or they order or design um, the the fabric that's kind of look like the old traditional weaving style so that you know that way is lighter so we can wear that in the summer and stuff like that so a lot of um you know sewer or designer are doing that now instead of using the old um, weaving fabric that is extremely hot and it you know I'm sure that takes because it takes a lot of time and people you know, now just don't really have the time to sit down and for a week to make one blanket or a shirt, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, it takes a dedicated person to do it, especially with the warping. You really can't have anybody interrupt you. I, I remember several times when Ju would get very flustered while she's warping and we're blah, blah, blah. And I finally realized that you have to, in fact, that's the, those are the words I learned when the women are saying one, two, sa, dwa, pa. And, and they're using the colors, white, gold, and then and red and so forth. So they have to count, they have to be aware of, okay, we got three white, and then we gotta go around the other way. And then we gotta go around this way when they're warping. So you really have to be able to have that kind of air traffic controller sensibility. If your baby's crying off to the side, you come back and you think, okay, where was I? And that would be very difficult to, to do. And Leanna, you probably might know a little bit more about this. I would think that in a traditional setting, if somebody is weaving, you might have somebody else that's watching over the little children so that those who are weaving can kind of focus on it. But when, when the time comes when it's time for something else, they can roll it up or they can kind of get up and, and do, do that next thing. Yeah. Um, Leanna, what did your mother weave? Uh, my mom used to do her weaving back um, when she was younger, back when I was little, when she was in Vietnam. Um, I, I remember she did like blankets or the baby carrier, um, just us sitting there and, you know, she would do a little bit each day and then, like you say, roll it up and hang it on the wall and then continue the next day. So I, I, I and we used to, we learned from her, she would teach us and make those little like this size or like a belt size. Yeah. We used to do that in the, you know, she taught us a little bit, but I was too young to remember, but I would really love it for us to be able to resume our weaving class and continue. It's just not about making a skirt or making a shirt, but you know, it's the art of it. You know, it's the the technique, the style, all those important things. And I think many of us might not consider we backstrap weaving as an art or whooping as an art, but it's an art form. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of concentration. Um, you know, no lies. It will take months to learn. And I think it's just an amazing work that our mothers and grandmothers did this back in the day and it's just amazing you know and many of them might cons not consider like they're smart because they don't have schooling but this is definitely a technique that takes thinking takes brain you know yeah yes and sometimes I'll see somebody have a little piece of the pattern in front of them of, of another weaving and then use that to guide them for this next warping that they're doing. So instead of translating, I know some weavers will put things onto graph paper and, and read and, and translate designs. They'll just simply take a piece, a leftover piece, and that's their guide, that's their blueprint for the next warp that they're going to make. With that said, we are at the 6.30, we're just past the 6.30 mark, and we try to wrap up on time. Um, Leanna, I'm just a voice uh, speaking over this whole thing, and I hate to be the, um, the person who interrupts this great conversation. Um, I thought maybe I could just say something real quick, and then you could help wrap up, wrap up the whole thing, Leanna. Is that, is that okay? Sounds good. Okay, so I did want to uh, just say something in addition to Betsy's story about going to Washington, D.C., and bringing Montagnard textiles before this expert. If, if, I'm, if my memory serves me right, this is a beautiful museum that has textiles from all over the world, especially by uh, indigenous people. And um, 
there was a special day that the museum would hold on a regular basis in which people could just bring their things in and then the, the, the museum experts could look at it and just tell you something about it. Ask an expert. Yeah, it was called Ask an Expert. So we just, I noticed that people were just bringing in all, you know, all kinds of just, you know, right. things, right. things that, that were lying around. And when Betsy brought in the Montagnard pieces and the, uh, the helpers of the museum saw those things, they immediately ran upstairs to get Matabel uh, Gettinger because they knew that this was a very, very special thing. So I just wanted to, to throw that story out because I was pretty amazed how quickly the museum responded. They just saw that these amazing pieces had come into their museum and they wanted to say something. Okay, with that, Leanne, I'm gonna leave it to you to do the wrap up and the goodbyes. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you all of the people who joined us on Zoom and all of our friends and community member who had tuned in on Facebook Live. We appreciate you hanging out with us this evening and especially to Betsy for taking her time to educate us on this artwork. We appreciate it. So stay tuned. We have another event tomorrow, Saturday and Sunday as well. Um, you can find all of those events on our uh, Facebook page, The Past is Present or under the Montana American Organization. And we have, hope everyone have a great night and thank you again for tuning in. And just be on the lookout on our Facebook page. We might have a weaving class coming up soon. So who knows? <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you all.